What's going on? Everybody. You've got the card board coach here with your boy, Coach Co. And team, today we've got a very special guest on the podcast here today. We've got Carrie from American Arbitrage and American Arbitrage Cards. How are you doing today, man? Dude, I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am. I'm pretty damn good. I'm excited. We I'm fired up. Let's talk, man. Let's talk shop. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, shooting the shit a little bit at the beginning, and uh, I'm thrilled. As someone who's con consumed a lot of your content, um, I'm excited to actually chat. And, you know, if you guys don't follow Carrie, I mean, you honestly should. Some of your stuff has come across my feed. I think I got into you. Um, you were doing like dollar box fines. And and yeah. I think that that stuff really appeals to the general public. And, that, and yes, you know, just, I mean, arbitrage in general is such a cool concept, right? Like it's something that it really is. I think a lot of people pick up on arbitrage without actually knowing what it means. And I kind of want to go into like how you decided on a name and, and and obviously your journey and stuff before I, I i'm done monologuing but it's uh it's it's very interesting because like it's like it's that concept of like one man's trash and another man's treasure right like if you 100%. find the right person i mean they're willing to pay up for things and we, we we see crazy stories all the time of people finding things like garage sales or like value villages or goodwills i mean there's a famous yeah. story about the uh oh three lebron james uh tops chrome gold rookie refractor yeah uh, was found at a gold, uh, at a goodwill. And yeah, it you know, happens they, all the time. Later I find stuff thousands of dollars. I find stuff to this day at the goodwill and at swap meets and at garage sales all the time, all the time. It's so it's, it's an area of, so arbitrage is basically, so everybody kind of understands what arbitrage is. It's finding an item that's kind of being sold in the improper venue uh, where it's, it can't get what it's worth yep. and then putting it in the correct venue. So like you could find a LeBron James, people might not believe this, but you could find something that's a, that would be very hard to find that particular card, but somebody found it and they definitely didn't pay what it was worth. No. And it was in the wrong marketplace for sure. At Goodwill. A lot of people walked by, had no clue it was worth any money. And then they put it in the appropriate market and, and sold it for a big, big, big money. And that that's rare, but it's not rare to find a, you know, a stack of cards at the, at the thrift store garage sale for 10 bucks and flip it. I mean, some of my biggest, ever flips are from estate sales, garage sales, and flea markets, like ever, like I'm talking under a dollar into hundreds of dollars. Really? I mean, it's happened. Yeah, it, it happens. Uh, during the boom, like back in 2020, uh, I was going to the flea market as I always do looking for everything, you know, action figures, pop culture stuff, MCM furniture. We did all sorts of stuff. And I found a box of soccer cards um, for $12 or actually it might've been 16, but it wasn't much. It's was like 200 cards. I was paying pennies per card. Um, and it was July, I think of 2020 and in August soccer cards, I don't know what happened, just went ballistic. And I had base Cristiano Ronaldo cards from like 2016 prism that I was selling. I sold four of them. I think it was three or four for $960. Somebody wanted to grade them, I guess at that time, it's insane. They're worth like 25, 30 bucks now, maybe. But at that time, at that moment, um, and I actually bought them, I sat them aside. I'm like, these are, this is a good lot, but I'm not going to deal with them right now. I started getting a bunch of offers on other soccer cards I had on eBay. And then I, I looked around on YouTube and saw that they were blowing up, looked up my cards. I'm like, Oh my gosh, the market's changed. Sell <laughs> when things get hot. You know, I'm not an investor. I sell when things get hot. My cards are gone. I'll buy more. They're replaceable. I love that. Uh, you touched on so many different things there. I want to dive into more of your finds. Um, actually, you know what, before we do that, so, where do you, where have you acquired all this information from? Cause I mean, you did just mention like, it's like, it's not just sports cards. It's like, I mean, you, yeah. you, you like furniture, you, you, you're on the lookout for a lot of things. So I guess my first question is where did you acquire all of this information? I, I, that's a good question. I think number one to, to do this and be this way is, is be curious. That's the biggest thing I could do. Like I went to, this is a joke, like within my page and I have a podcast and stuff that I have three degrees. I literally went to college, have three degrees and did nothing with them. But I think I got those because I was, I was just curious. I liked, like, I wanted to just stay in school and not like ever get a real job for, for like a long time. That was kind I mean, of serial students. Are, like, <laughs> yeah. I was a serial student. Yeah. I was there too long and yeah. I graduated in my late twenties um, with three degrees. And then I went directly into reselling because that caught my interest. Uh, in between time, I was taking some time off before I went to 
grad school and stuff like that to get my master's and all that. Um, and I just, I watched some of the TV shows, um, you know, Pawn Stars, American Pickers. Yeah. That was all huge at the time, like 2011. Yeah. Um, and what I learned and, and what anybody can do right now is like YouTube is an invaluable resource. TikTok, Instagram, all of it. And back in 2011, there was maybe three dudes talking about yard sales, like three in the whole. And I don't know if anybody was talking about cards, but I had, I had sold some cards before. So I dabbled in that and I started getting into reselling in general, watching all the videos I could, all that was available. And, and then the biggest teacher is experience. So like within a year of graduating, year and a half, I opened my first retail um, antique store. Uh, six months after that, I started a live auction business in Utah. Um, I found you didn't have to have an auction license, just a business license in Utah to run an auction. So I had my location, but I didn't have enough space to do an auction. Um, so I just drove around, went to local businesses, restaurants, and saw if they'd be open to having a live auction at their place, like on a Tuesday when they're slow. Second place I went into was like, let's do it. Um, we started an auction there. That's how I met my girlfriend of the last 10 years. She'd come no to my auction, uh, sell stuff. She'd, she'd consign stuff and buy stuff and flip on eBay. And that's a big teacher, having people bring you stuff in every week, week after week. You seeing what does sell, what doesn't sell you, you know, in some form, trying to educate them that like, this is not valuable. Porcelain dolls, you know, only your grandma wants them, you know, or beanie babies. Sorry, not super valuable. They, they may seem like it, but they're not. Or, you know, what this is valuable. This, this card is from then or that. That, that educates you, but you just got to get out there and do, you can't sit in the sidelines. You got to get out there and work, make mistakes. That's like the best teacher is when you overpay for something, whether it's cards or anything, and you're like, I'll never make that mistake, but also it helps you down the line. So you, you maybe miss a hundred other mistakes you could have made from that lesson. So it actually can pay off. I can go on like 50 tangents, man, but I, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so I think one of the biggest things for me is like the accountability is, is huge. And I love hearing that uh out of out of your mouth i mean someone who's been, been very successful at what he's been doing you know we hear a lot of stuff of, of like people like pump and dump and like uh, like you like there's a lot of like oh you led these people in this direction and and stuff like that and like i've fallen down the rabbit hole and and bought things like perhaps in the hype and i've just gotten absolutely smoked and yeah. and i and like you just mentioned I, I i'm like perfect i'm never doing that again you know, like yeah. I'm never like I learned and I'm like, no, yeah, my I'm never do my again. feet, my, my of my whole channel, like American arbitrage cards. My thesis is you don't I mean, I do a little bit of that. Everybody does. It's fun. Yeah, of but course. like my thesis is you don't have to to make yeah. money into this business. There are people I mean, the bargain boxes are a great example. A lot of these guys with high end cards. They don't want to deal with a 10, 15, $20 card. They're not interested. They'll put it in a, in a $2 box, a $5 box, a dollar box sometimes. And you, and, and the cool thing, you'll get a stack of those at that price. Then they'll give you a discount on, on top of that. Of they're more than happy to get rid of those cards. And if you're willing to, to grind it out, do whatnot, or do eBay, you can make money in the margins there without having to speculate. I mean, sure. You, maybe you'll hold a few because you believe in that player or whatever. Yeah. No, you didn't risk anything really though. A buck, two bucks. If it yeah. doesn't pan out, you're, you're fine. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one of the biggest things about bargain boxing and arbitrage. There, it's it's well, a big and, opportunity. And any, anyone can participate. Anyone, yeah, that's hundred percent right. Where do you find these garage sales, dude? Um, is there like a secret? Like, is there like a secret there's a stash? yard sale treasure map? It's an app called Yard Sale Treasure Map. Okay. Historically, though, I, I would uh, a free ball it, so to speak. I would go out on a Saturday morning, and people have signs out. You don't really have to use a, an app. An app does help. Um, and then I just, you get up early, you know, six or seven or whatever, or five, you can get up even earlier and you just drive around um, on a Saturday morning in the summer in most places. I'm in Vegas. So our season is for garage sales is like January to, to April because it's super hot right now. People don't yeah. want to be out, but yeah. And you just drive around and you um, talk to people. And the cool thing about it, oftentimes with those, like, cause I do those videos uh, for cards and also for, for regular garage sale content. A lot of people are like, oh, you rip this person off. You rip that person off. When they don't really realize the people have jobs, they have no interest in reselling. They just want to get rid of stuff. They want to clear out stuff. They want yeah. space more than they want, you know, to sit down and have to ship stuff. So it's it's a service in a way that we're, we're, we're providing and we're getting a discount because of that oftentimes because we're, we're taking stuff out of their house they want gone. So, yeah, I mean, it's funny. That was my next question. My next question is like, how do you deal with, I mean, obviously you create a lot of content. It's not just like you working in the shadows and like you document yeah. a lot of these processes yeah, and you know, when it comes to margins and stuff and even like arbitrage in general, like you, 
have you ever found something that is way underpriced and felt obligated to tell the person? Um, I have in cards occasionally, like recently I found like it was in the $5 bin and it was probably like a 40, $50 patch. I think it was a mistake. And, and knowing them, they probably would have honored the price, but I was yeah. like, oh, you got to take, you got to take this out. Yeah. But I mean, in general, I, I don't feel a huge obligation at a yard sale to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I guess if the yard sale was like for a, a cause or something, yes. But if it's just people liquidating, you know, there's a lot to it. Say I find an item for $5 that's worth $150. First off, I have the knowledge to know that, that, that took time to acquire. Second off, I have to do all the work to actually get that sold and market and everything. So, I mean, I'm pretty honest with people and let them know I'm a reseller. Almost always people get on me a lot about that, but it opens up more opportunities, um, opens up more doors than it closes for me because most of the time people are like, oh, you're a reseller. I've got more junk in my house. You want to come check it out? And I get more stuff. Um, occasionally people don't like it. That's understandable, but it helps me more than it hurts me. But in general, I think if it was egregious, like obvious, something crazy, I would probably tell them. I hope. But um, yeah, everybody's got a different idea on that. And that I don't I don't necessarily feel like it's unethical not to tell people because they have just as much ability to figure out the value of anything as we do. So yeah, and that's why it's interesting to have like these accountability conversations, right? Because like you're right. I mean, you could with how you you got all of this knowledge from searching stuff online do you know what yeah. i mean like watching videos and me personally i'm not selling anything unless i know 100 like like what it is unless i really just don't want to deal with it in which case like i'm okay if someone offers me 20 bucks and it's like i listed it for 30 you know like i'm recently going through this with like a lot of the stuff in my apartment like i'm getting ready for a move and i've listed like a ton of stuff on facebook marketplace and I've done like some due diligence in terms of like figuring out what the market will pay for stuff and like what, what they're listed for currently and, and trying to be priced accordingly. But like at the end of the day, like I, I'm okay with obviously that price. So yeah. if, if someone comes in and offers me, you know, something close to that, I'm like, yeah, take it. But it, even if someone were to say, oh, that's actually worth 500 bucks, like unless I know where to take that for, for like, I actually just want it gone. Like, I'm not saying I wouldn't yeah. take more money, but at the same time, like I'm okay with, I want this thing gone. So, and that's, that's the trick of arbitrage from the sellers and especially at a garage sale. That is probably the worst place to sell many items because you know, you're, you're going to get random spattering of people that most of which are not interested in your particular items. Yeah. So it's either got to be like at a price where they're like, I wasn't going to get this, but I'll pick this up for the house or something or for myself, yeah. or more than likely be a person like myself, maybe with the GoPro strapped on looking for a deal. Now, if somebody's priced fair, I'm not a big negotiator. Like if it's like a, a video game and it's worth a hundred bucks and they're asking 25 more than likely, and I know I can get a hundred, I'll pay five, 25. I'm not yeah. like a negotiation for negotiation sake. Yeah, guy. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but I will when I negotiate, which I do, you'll see on my videos, it's because I'm on the edge or I'm you know, a lot of times with cards, it's because I want them and it's maybe not even the best deal, but I I love cards too. I'll sell two dollar cards, I'll sell three dollar cards, I'll take the risk of sitting on these cards for a year and a half because I have car dealer pro and I have software to do it, you know. Yeah, and it allows me to do what I love. That's like my Zen meditation time going through yeah. and posting that stuff. So you're telling me your Zen and meditation time is posting cards? Yes. Weird, right? No, <laughs> like I am, like I'm different than most people. Most I people hate in re that. <laughs> yeah, most people, most people in reselling, uh, the part they like the most is obviously the finding. Everybody likes that the most. Yeah. But between um, listing and shipping, most people prefer shipping because it's like the end of the process, right? Gone. Yeah. Almost like I'd say 80% of the people I talk to are like that. Um, I'm one of the 20% that like to list. I get all the enjoyment out of a card's value or an item's value when I list it. I half the time don't even realize I sell it. I'm a team with my girlfriend. My girlfriend does the shipping. Um, I bought some Pokemon cards the other day. Didn't even realize they sold till like the next day when I looked uh, randomly through our sales on eBay. I, I for, I'm like, oh, we sold them all. I guess I'll go buy some more. I don't know what I'm doing on Pokemon. So I'm just taking some chances, learning. And that's another thing I love to do is like, especially with low end stuff, I'll be like, I'm, I'm going to buy a bunch of dollar EX Pokemon cards. See if I can get three a piece for them. See where the market is. Maybe not that I'm going to do that full time. But I want to understand why did this car sell fast? Why did this one not sell at all? It'll help me when I'm out in the field to maybe find a 10 or 20 or $30 card in a bargain box. I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole process, honestly. I mean, I can Except tell it. And I'm fascinated by your fascination. So 
How awesome. do you <laughs> how do you keep margins down for low end stuff? Because I mean that's the stuff that people a lot of times don't want to deal with because of things like shipping and fees and all that other stuff. So like that's kind of how you keep the margins down is like people don't want to deal with them, so you can get them for pennies on the dollar, especially if you're willing to buy big boxes. Um, so like anytime I am putting a dollar stack together, I'm typically getting another. I mean, on the minimum, twenty five percent off that usually, and sometimes it's a lot more. Sometimes it's almost fifty percent. So like it happens, and you don't. I don't want to ever assume that's going to happen. And I'm not yeah. really asking for that. I'm putting a stack together, anticipating paying full price, Yeah, but it happens a lot because I think much like the garage sale sense, like they're happy to get rid of that stuff. Um, they're like, great. That's like free money. You know, that was yeah. just stuff we eat from a box break, or that was stuff from a buyout that we wanted these five cards that are in the showcase, but we got this stack. Uh, we're happy to get rid of those. That's extra money. And, and you can kind of play off that because for me, I, I, I like, playing on that low end most people don't it's a grind um i have tools that help with it um and i'm trying to get more into mid-end for me mid-end is like 220 to 100 dollars stuff but i don't think i'm ever going to be a guy that does much above that yeah. it's too risky people like especially nowadays with with the repackers it's hard to get a deal like a 500 dollars card so people are going to want to get the money out of it they're not yeah. but you can get 500 dollars cards worth 1500 dollars for 300 bucks so you just gotta you and you spread out your risk too so yeah i agree with you i think um you know especially with the the way that the market's kind of shifted is like repackers i mean a lot of the liquidity at shows are repackers and like repackers are paying like 80 90 percent of comps and they can afford to because they're charging like 120 percent markups on their yeah. packs right so i mean they make their margins and they're like yeah i have no problem like i'm just looking for quant like quantity and quality right like and yeah. so you kind of get priced out of that. I, I would also say that like the volatility of, of today's market makes things terrifying. Cause like you could buy a $600 card. Like let's say you buy a, a base Luca prism and like he's in the finals right now. A lot of people want his stuff, but like within two weeks, if he loses, it's probably going yeah. down. You exactly. know what I mean? Whereas like, and so if you don't sell that thing quickly, like, I mean, you've just lost 40, 50% equity in that. So yeah, you, you don't want to hold on to anything you can't afford to hold on to. So like yeah. uh, if, if you believe in somebody and you can afford it, hold on forever. It doesn't matter. Never sell it if you don't want to. It doesn't yeah. matter. But if, if, if you're trying to make money in this game and, and you've paid at a certain price and it goes up at any point, in my opinion, this is just an opinion, of course. Um, I'd get rid of it. I'd get rid of it and move it into whoever the next or, or I don't know. Like it's tough in that game. It's a little different than I play. I dabble and I'm not as strong in that aspect of the game as I am with the low end yeah. because it just low ends much easier to predict and low ends much easier to, to handle. Like people are, it's, it's plentiful and people want to get rid of it. Yeah. I also think that just the buyer pool is like larger for low end stuff. Like yeah. the average person is much like way more willing to spend $10 or $8 on a sports car than they are to spend 50 or a hundred. You throw, you throw like a, I'm, I'm not a huge PC guy, but you throw a random 1990s Utah jazz player, like autograph five bucks or below in a card show. I'm, I'm a buyer pretty much every time when it starts to get into real money, graded stuff, then I'm, I'm probably not a buyer, but there's just, and I'm not a big buyer. There's a lot of people like me that yeah. it's their team. And if it's the right kind of era or the right team, they'll pay up to a certain amount. They don't care. They don't care about what the resale is. Cause they're not reselling. It. That's exactly it. And I mean, I think that, that that's important too, is like, so much of the market has been like, what is this comp at? But like, yeah. we're talking about putting things potentially in the, in like forever homes. And like, those yeah. people don't really care. And I think that's kind of what arbitrage is about, right? Like, yeah, it's the, it's, it's the crux of it. It's the hardest part of it is, yeah. is trying to, to figure out how to get your stuff to the end buyer and not yeah. just to another middleman along yeah. the way. And that's what in, in our modern market with the high end, it doesn't even feel like there is an end buyer. It's just middleman to middleman to middleman, up, down, backwards, forwards, back and forth. People are rebuying cards they got three months ago. I mean, which is just another arbitrage, I guess, in a way. It's just a lot riskier. Um, but yeah, we're the, the best case scenario for me with the dollar boxes is I'm getting like, you know, a, a, a Miles Simon autograph played for Arizona. He was a legend at Arizona. I pick those up for a buck all the time. That's like, I think six to $12, depending on the autograph. He's a legend there. It may take a month and a half, six weeks to sell it, but somebody is going to be like, oh yeah, I went to co college in the late nineties at Arizona. I'm going to buy that. I mean, it could be six, it could be 12. They don't care. Uh, yeah. They'll buy it either way. So. Yeah. It's funny in, in like hockey in, in Canada is so liquid, especially in Toronto. And like, I was at the Philly show probably three months ago. And I was buying like 
Leafs players for like a buck, two bucks and bringing them here. And it was like eight to $12. Yeah. I'm like, this is beautiful. I'm like, this is, and I know exactly, it's wild, isn't it? I know exactly who's going to buy them. You know what I mean? Like I, I knew right up with buying them. I was like, oh, this person's going to love this one. This person's going to love this one. Like that's the beauty of arbitrage is like, yeah, if you're, yeah, there's a lot to that. Cause if you're traveling and you're from a specific, obviously everybody's from somewhere um, you can arbitrage when you're out of town, you know, and buy stuff for your hometown. I mean, I'm in, I, I grew up most of my life in Utah and it's a very particular uh, set of things in Utah. I mean, Utah's known for Mormons, for example. Um, so there's a lot of like religious books. So we would used to find all these rare religious Mormon books and we'd sell them to people in, in Nevada or New York or across the country or other side of the world because they couldn't get them anywhere. Wow. You only get them in Utah and Toronto. Like you could find, I mean, I'm not sure what the market is on like Tim Horton cards. They're probably not huge, but like in Canada, you guys can get those. We can't get those. Yeah. Um, yeah. here in, in the States. So there's like a certain arbitrages uh, that, yeah. you know, anything Canadian you can get that we can't get easily here could be sellable beyond cards could be anything. I don't know, like statues of Mounties, the police guys, I don't know, <laughs> stuff like that would probably be, there'd be somebody down here who would want that. Moose statues, man. Moose statues. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What's your favorite part of all of this? You know what I dig and, and it probably shows a lot and I didn't realize I'd love it as much as I do is the content end of this. It was an outlet. I had listened to Gary V talk about doing social media for a few years before I had actually buckled down and did it. And it, it totally changed my life. Like completely. I was a, a small shop owner in Utah when I started doing, um, just talking about what I found at garage sales and stuff. Yeah. And nothing really took off for me. My main YouTube didn't, my Instagram took forever, but for whatever reason, TikTok, like my sixth video, I was at a, a movie going to see a movie with my girlfriend. And I'm like, I think TikTok's uh, glitching out, Don. Uh, it's showing like every time I come back in, it's like a thousand up, a thousand up. And for whatever reason, that moment I hit an algorithm. And that's the thing with like TikTok, especially once you hit an algorithm, you just feed that beast. You feed that one, that one, that one, that one. And then you can kind of explore other things and see what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. But you just feed the beast that's working. And that's kind of what's helped me grow with social media. And I love the, the strategy of it. Uh, I've been doing it so long that I, it may not look like it in my videos, but they're, and, and I've done it so long that it's kind of second nature, but there's a lot of thought process to the way I do things. The reason I do things like when I'm going to open a box, I don't start at my house where I'm here with a box. I'm at a place, a Walmart or a target. I'm doing a physical movement. That's like my thumbnail. And then whatever silly thing I say out of my mouth, that's my title. You know, it's like, uh, let's go. I'm going to buy this junk. So you don't have to, you know, like, you're like, what, you know, or they'll be like, oh, it looks like uh, all this, all the, all the boxes are locked up at this Walmart today. You know, everybody's going to complain about that. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's yeah. like, it's a thumbnail and the movement is my, my, uh, well, the movement's my thumbnail. And then the, the, what I say is my title YouTube yeah. speak. So yeah. um, I love that aspect. I love studying it. I love thinking about it. And I was a theater kid, like growing up in high school and college. So I have been able to access that part of myself that I kind of let go away for years. I love that. And it's also funny because I just had a conversation like this, maybe like an hour ago with like, I was, I was just on a call with a, you know, a friend of mine who was talking about like just social media strategies and stuff. And, and we were going through and talking just about the algorithm and, and analytics. And, and I was explaining to him my thought process when it comes to creating videos, like, you know, the importance of like the hook and like, you know, what, what my markers are in terms of like a successful video and like what my goal is when like someone create, like someone comes to my page and he's like, there's so many aspects that I didn't even think of. And I'm like, I'm obsessed with this stuff. Like I, I love it. Like, I think it's so cool to, to have this opportunity in front of us. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's life changing if you apply it and, and things like it's taken years but TikTok is starting to pay decent if you do minute long videos. So there's actually that angle to where it could not only be a side hustle, but it could be one of your main hustles. What are they, do. what are they paying uh, per minute? I mean, it goes up and down anywhere from like 75 cents to over a dollar, dollar 10. So what like, you, like, what, like, what do you mean? So like I do minute long videos only. If you watch my uh, TikTok, it's always over a minute. Yeah. Everyone, because that's how you're in the, I think it's called the creator beta. Fun. You have to be over yeah, like 10,000. And um, it, it pays some real money now. It didn't for years. What? I've had. Talk I'll to me just about that. Straight because up, like, I'll straight up I'm talk numbers. I'll, I'll straight up talk I'm numbers. I'm not getting paid shit because I think it's fun, and I think people should know this because yeah. a lot of people could benefit from this. Yeah. I have, and this this is a little, I guess, backhand braggy, but I've had maybe like 80 million view videos on my main account, maybe more. 
Um, and typically back in the day with the old creator fund, it was, I'd make 30 to $60 on that. Not yeah, a lot it's of like, It was like 10 cents, 10 cents, yeah. every, like hundred thousand or something. If you were lucky. Yeah. yeah. And it was totally unpredictable. Now yeah. they have a model that's much more like YouTube where you're paid per view that qualifies. So they have to watch over five seconds or something, but it has to be over a minute. So once it's over a minute, um, now, you know, last month on TikTok, my card channel, I made like 2,400 just on my card channel. Um, and that's not counting everything else. I put that same video on Instagram, which doesn't monetize well. Facebook monetizes decent. I make like two or 300 off my shorts on YouTube. Not, and this isn't counting my long form stuff that I put everywhere as well. So, and I have two pages. So, I mean, this is something you can do, but you have to be over a minute. You have to keep people's attention for a certain amount of time. Um, you know, but there's a lot, a lot of opportunity with TikTok right now. And there wasn't for years, like money wise, like people thought I was crazy for a long time for putting so much time. I didn't miss a day of TikTok on my yeah, main channel for 19 months. And, you know, and, and I wasn't making much money, you know, a couple hundred a month if I was lucky. And, um, it finally started to pay off and, and with TikTok, who knows it could go away, but, um, I know here's the thing, I know. here's the thing that won't go away is the ability to make short content. I agree there's gonna be another. I agree there's going to be another you. place to plug and play this. I agree People think you. TikTok is gone and you're screwed. No, people want short. And it's not only short. I, I get passionate about this. I think of it more as vertical content versus horizontal. Yeah. That's why you can do minute long, three minute long. You could do segments of this podcast, which I think you might do, yeah. um, like for three minutes long in this vertical format, or sorry, yeah, vertical format. And if it's something that that resonates, you you could make some decent money on one particular clip that you're already making money on YouTube on. And it's fun, dude. I love the chess of it all, which I didn't have a clue about when I started other than I heard you can make money doing this, but I didn't know how yeah. um, to like being pretty into it at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't aware of like the, the like TikTok creative funds. Um, and like, I need to, I need to figure it out. Yeah, we'll talk, <laughs> we can talk more about it, man. I'm, I'm all for, uh, I mean, you make good quality content. It's funny. My girlfriend knows who you are. Really? Um, I don't know. Like, she doesn't really follow, she vaguely follows cards because she like, she'll, wa anytime my video comes up, she'll watch it for yeah. the algorithm, right? She'll just yeah. like, she already knows what I found or what I did or, um, but then she starts getting other card videos Yeah, and she likes your card videos. Cause like it explains stuff that's going on to her. Uh, so that, you know, when we're in like a whatnot life, she'll watch them a lot. She's like taught. She's like, do you know the guy with, you know, you had the mustache. I had the mustache. I know. And you're, 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 you're you, you didn't want to be that, that to be your brand, which I understand, but that's how she was like, you know, the guy with the yeah, mustache. That's okay. That a lot. I mean, that, that's what um, it was for a period of time though. Right. And like, I knew that that's, I was like, you know what, like, this is what we're going to ride. Like, but uh, I was like, man, it's I don't... a good way to kind of get known at first. And then you just yeah. move on. I think it was smart yeah. to move on though, just for your own sake. Yeah. I was kind of want to have this thing forever, man. <laughs> unless you loved it, unless that was like just what you wanted, then that's yeah. another thing. But it's then you're just pigeonholed though. Right. It's kind of like the same way, like with content. It's like you, uh, you do that. that happens you want to be able lot. to do whatever the hell you want. You know, you're like, you can just pivot. I think a lot of people, people, they just like, they, they, they're, they feel like they can't get outside like a box sometimes. And I try to encourage people like, man, if you like something and you want to talk about it, just talk about it. And like, eventually the market will create itself. Like if you're passionate about yeah. something, people will gravitate towards that thing. doesn't matter what you it could, is. You could also start a second similar channel, which is what I did. And it changed everything. Like I wanted to talk about cards and I did some of my biggest American arbitrage, YouTube and shorts are card related, but I realized a lot of people on my main channel weren't interested in sports cards, but I was. So I, I kind of suppressed that for like a year. Like I didn't talk much about it. It was just my side thing. And then everybody was like, start another channel. And I didn't want to at all. And, and then I finally did. And immediately it worked. I was tripped out because I didn't talk about it on my other channel. Uh, very, very, it didn't, at least what little I did didn't help. Yeah. It was just, it's not I like, guess, what like I, you were just bringing people over. Yeah, it, it didn't. Yeah, I didn't bring a lot of people over from my main page. Yeah. Uh, I did realize a lot of people recognized my voice. That seemed yeah. to carry over, and that might have helped with it grow at the beginning. For sure. Because, but it's cool. It's you have taking, a very recognizable voice. So you said yeah. you, you were working with. Uh, you you've been in like theater and stuff. Yeah, I did theater. I've done like in front of the camera work. You know, training nice. and stuff. I have zero fear of of being in front of the camera or being in front. I mean, in front of people maybe a little bit, but not yeah. much. Um. And I'm pretty confident in that aspect of my personality. I can wing things pretty well. I've done, I, I have my podcast that I do uh, called Trash to Cash Podcast that we've, we, you know, we've been doing for two years plus now. And, and we just wing it every, I've gotten used to winging stuff and just yeah. going with the punches and seeing what, what happens. <laughs> yeah. And you're good at that too. And I think that's the key to like a good podcast is you can't be too 
set in your storyboard that you have, but you should have a storyboard if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but like you, if there's some cool topic and your brain is like, I want to talk more about that. I think you go down that because that's what makes interesting content is like, if you're thinking that there's probably 20 people, 30 people watching, thinking the same thing. I want to know more about that or that or this. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, so let's talk a little bit really quickly about like some, some recent events that have happened. Like for instance, targets no longer allowing resellers. Like how, like, is that something that, that would affect you? Is that, you know, like, I, I, I mean, if I don't think it's a total ban yet, from what I could tell, that might've been a particular store. I still go okay. to my local target, but target has always been anti-reseller, not just for cards, but for, there's a lot of people who go and flip clearance in, in, in the garage sale flipper realm really? and, and they don't want you using your red card or whatever it's called. I kind of stopped doing that. I don't really support target too much on that stuff, but I will yeah. buy cards from them. Uh, Cause they're, they're, they're placed out in a way that's visually stimulating for yeah. me. That's what matters. I want an opening segment of my TikTok videos that looks cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, like card shows are often really good for that too. Yeah. Um, so we, I haven't had trouble yet. I may at some point, and if I do, I'll go to a different target or if they say no, I'll go to Walmart. If they, that's the thing. Um, what do they say? Um, basically struggle or whatever, whatever is like the necessity of invention. There's something along that line. So if, if something doesn't work, I'll figure out another way that works. I'll just figure it out. Whether it's for flipping or whether it's for content creation or whatever, there's always a way, man. I found I find cards everywhere I go across the US. And it's not because uh, they're easily available everywhere. It's just that I have the drive to find them. Yeah. Not because and, and I have some connections at this point to find them. That helps too. But uh, if, if you want something bad enough, people say all the time, I don't have those deals at Walmarts in my area. I bet you there's a Walmart in your area if your town's big enough. Or you might have to go an hour away but maybe just do that once a month but buy a bunch when you go out um there's a lot of a lot of things you can do if you're willing i mean this is you're you're talking you're right up my alley right now it's just like I, it sounds like there's there's just no excuses like if you want to do something you just do there it. isn't man there is I, and it's cool it's such a cool time to live in if you are obsessed with 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 ants and, and and ant farms and stuff you could start a tiktok page and make a living doing it and a youtube so it's just it's such a cool time to be alive dude you stitch can do whatever went, you stitch want went like like viral my girlfriend knows who stitches and i please i know do you know what i mean too. like that's he just plays video games like you don't video think games. that would work and this is he's, something he's, he was at the nfl draft like this like random kid that like would be like otherwise completely like unrecognizable on the street it's pretty uh, just cool, isn't it? Because he was passionate about playing video games and like, you know, just record, so he's recorded all the time. And, and, and it's, all of, it's because like, there's something, it's not his video games. It's him. It's his personality. It's yeah. letting it out. And I think about this when I create shorts, especially there's the first level of people we want to get to, especially in cards, which is the card people. But the real trick is to get beyond the card people. So when I, I do this with garage sales all the time, everybody instinctually is a pirate, a treasure hunter. Everybody wants to find a deal, whether they know it or not. So I go out and I don't focus so much on flipping this on eBay and how to sell on eBay. I focus on, look at this treasure I found that was undervalued and look how much it's worth. The same thing with the bargain boxes. It's the same thing. You, you remember, there's like millions of dudes who don't collect anymore and, and ladies who don't collect anymore. But when they see a video like, oh man, I remember that set of cards when I was a kid. I wonder if one of my cards I have in my, my basement is worth that much. You know, they might not be into cards. It may get them back into cards, but there's like something to that treasure hunting aspect and opening boxes is similar treasure hunting, I guess, gambling to a certain degree. Um, that's that, you know, that's really, really instinctual. It's really, I human. also, I think that everyone's collected something at some point, exactly. you know, like, I think that we're all naturally, we, we've, we like hoard things. We like, and, and some people it's like tickets, some people it's shoes. It's, I mean, I know yeah. people that have collected like rubber duckies or, you know, my girlfriend collects uh, like fridge magnets of like places she's gone to, like no matter what, even if someone's like, oh, I'm not a collector. Like if you look deep enough, someone's collected at some point. And so like, it's just oh, yeah. a matter of like, like, can your content trigger that? Yeah. Something instinctually human. And I'm not a sociologist, but there's something human about it. And the more I think to, to, for content purposes, the more we can tap into that, the better chance we have of being successful on that end. And the more successful we are, the more we can get out our message about uh, collecting, reselling, whatever we're doing in the hobby. Having fun. So, yeah, just having fun too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I do this because it's fun. I could do other stuff and probably be just as, if not more successful, but uh, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. No, I'd rather make I... less doing this. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, you're definitely not using the degrees. <laughs> or, or no, not, at not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Ren, I really appreciate you being on. 
talk to me really quickly. Uh, let the audience know where can they follow you? Where can they, they jump in on the journey? Maybe they have something for sale that they don't know what it's worth. Maybe they can contact you. Maybe they just want to dump something and they're like, yeah, man, Carrie's the guy. Yeah. Hit me up, man. Uh, for sports card stuff, it's American arbitrage cards on YouTube, Insta, TikTok, and Facebook. And then for American arbitrage, uh, which is garage sale, thrifting style stuff, same. It's uh, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and also YouTube. I'm on like Pinterest. I tried on Snapchat. I, I okay. got tired of those, but I did everything yeah. for a while. Um, but yeah, you could you look up my name, you'll you'll find me. I'm I'm pretty much everywhere. Amazing, brother. I want to thank you so much for jumping on, team. You heard him. American arbitrage, American arbitrage cards. At the very least, you'll be incredibly entertained. I promise. Uh, thank you, man. Carrie, man, I really appreciate you being on. Team, I appreciate hope you enjoyed you. this week's episode of The Cardboard Coach featuring Carrie from American Arbitrage. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, go have fun out there.